Well, thank you, Chad and Katie. I would rather just get up here and say amen and sit down. But since Rob gave me three hours, I'm going to take it. So. I'd say greetings to you all, and those on the webcast. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this week. You know, in a letter written to the Roman Senate around 47 B.C., Julius Caesar is credited for using this phrase, Vini, Vidi, Vici. And those words that he penned captured what he desired to proclaim. It was his quick victory in that shore war against King uh, Farnesius II of Pontus at the Battle of Zella. And we know that phrase, you've heard it, you probably know it more translated in English, I came, I saw, I conquered. Now fast forward some 2,000 years for here to this day, and I want us all to consider just what we have experienced over these short eight days here in Spokane Valley, Washington. Just like Caesar. We came here with a goal. We came here full of excitement, anticipation. We were looking forward to spending this wonderful time with our physical families, those who traveled here and had physical families, but we loved to be here surrounded by the ecclesia, our spiritual families. We also brought with us an appetite, an appetite to feast at the table that God has set before us. And we didn't bring a sack lunch. We wanted what God would provide. But just like Julius Caesar in that swift battle, here we are, the last service. Some of us will be leaving soon, packing up, because it went by in the blink of an eye. It goes like that. This life moves like that. So as we settle in for one last message, I want you to do something for me. I want you to consider, consider everything that you experience during this wonderful feast, everything you've heard so far on this eighth day. And what news, what news would you want to send forth? If you had to write a letter to declare with great excitement what you've experienced, what you have accomplished this time, how would you capture, how would you proclaim those words? Would it be, and if Google Translation is right, I'll be right. Would it be venomous, vitimus, inspirate sumus? We came, we saw, we've been inspired. And if you want a title, that will be the title of this message. Because we did come here with a purpose. <clears throat> we came here and we have received. And what we have received, brethren, it has to be inspirational for us. We need this time. Now think about that statement. And I want you now to think about this letter that you would pen if you had a chance to write. What are some of the details? What are some of the details that you would want to share that would perfectly capture those words? That would back up those words, we came, we saw, we've been inspired. What would be those details to back up such a powerful statement? Because we should have a lot to say. We should have a lot just ready to burst forth. Because we had this feeling of accomplishment. However, that letter would be a lot different than the letter that Julius Caesar wrote. You see, we're not proclaiming any victory over some army. Our battles, yes, we have fought some, we've won some, we lost some. But you and I still find ourselves in the midst of a war. We're still in the midst of a war, and the person in which that letter would be addressed would be ourselves. Dear Ryan, dear whoever you, your name is, fill in the blank. We would write that because we should be wanting to be edified. We don't want to let go, as we heard. We can't forget what we've been given. We need this for our own benefit, because I did come. I did see so much, and I have been inspired to keep going forward. You know, we heard 
yesterday from Mr. Phelps, and he read a passage from a journal he wrote many years ago. And we, too, must be willing to write these things down. But, brethren, not on paper. Write them on the tables of your heart. Put them there so they are solidified to why I do what I do. It's important because David wrote these things in Psalm 119, verse 11, and chapter 40, verse 8. He said, your word I have hidden in my heart. I delight to do your will, my God, and your law. Your law is not just something I carry around. No, he said, your law is within. It's within my heart. We can't let the anticipation. We cannot let the excitement. We cannot let the joy that has been impressed upon our hearts and our minds just die out. It can't just fade away. It's our lifeline, brethren. I'm speaking to the choir here today. You know what you need. It's your connection to hope in a world that's doing everything it can to take away your connection to that hope. Satan knows that as well. He's eagerly waiting. He's eagerly waiting to attack. He's tried to do attacks already. And he would have us. He would have us lose that focus Forget about what we've experienced and sink into this dark, deep abyss of depression, of hopelessness. So now, now is a critical step in our walk in this life. We have to make a choice. Will I remember who I am? Will I remember who I stand with? You know, General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, once said this to those under his command. He said, the tendency of fire is to go out. Watch the fire on the altar of your heart. Expositor's commentary added this thought, and it said, anyone who's ever tended a fire knows that it needs to be stirred up occasionally. We came. We saw. We've been stirred. So in these final hours, Let's not just add fuel to the fire. Let us gather. Let us store up that fuel that we will definitely need to keep this fire burning brighter than ever before. Because we're going to face some dark, cold days ahead of us. The next days, weeks, months ahead. There's going to be battles. There's going to be things we need to face. God says, gather now. Why is day we do what we have to do? It's what we need to push forward because the fuel that we gathered here today, the fuel that should be burning on this altar in our heart is highlighting the vision, giving us that not just a hope, but stirring that expectation of the fulfillment of what we hope for. Even in the face of great adversity, it reminds us we are the people of God. We are children of promise. We are those who trust. We are those who have committed to continue to walk in the way, the way that Christ has outlined, the way that we choose to emulate him, and we'll do it till he returns. So what I've done is I've taken that statement, we came, we saw, we've been inspired, and I broke it up in those three points to help us identify and gather the fuel. So let's quickly go through these points this afternoon. Point one, we came. In that very first message to begin this feast, Mr. Slocum asked that well-known question, why are we here? Two days later, he asked, why are you still here? He asks those questions because there must be a reason. There's got to be an intent to why we engage in the activities we do, especially when it comes to the work of God. We have to have purpose. God wants us to know that purpose because God wants us to understand that purpose is connecting us to that eternity, that eternity he placed in our hearts, that desire. In fact, 
we read it already multiple times. It was read this morning, but in Leviticus 23, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, just at the beginning. Leviticus 23, verse 1 states, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. And then we went through and reread what we did over the past seven days and what we're doing here today. We came because God called. We came because these are his feasts. These are his special appointments. He called. We answered that summons to come before our God. And we gathered here, not for a vacation, not for a convention. We gathered here to be in his presence for a specific purpose, a sacred meeting, to be face to face with our God. That purpose alone fueled that burning desire inside our hearts. We wanted to be here. You know, I was going over my message last night. And when I read these words, I thought about what was written in Mark 19 and, or Matthew 19 and Mark 10 that we'll read in a couple weeks when we do the blessing of little children. And I heard these words, our Abba, our Father saying, let my little children, let my kids come before me. Let me bless them. Let them come out of this world. Let them forget what's wearing them down. Lay it aside. Leave it behind them. And come experience a moment, a time to be refreshed. They desperately need this. Abba knows what we need. Our Father in Heaven knows that. And He wanted us to see the value to come here. To come here and to remain here. In Hosea 4, verse 6, it states, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because we understood what he was saying, we came to prevent that. We want to know. We want to be known by our God. We want it to be exposed to our God. We want to be exposed in greater detail to his plan. That's why we didn't just show up. You and I, we took the time since last feast to prepare, to plan. In fact, what do we do just a few days short uh, before the feast? We fasted in order that we could be able to be filled with the feast of God, to be here. We fasted before we feasted. We wanted to be filled to the brim what God placed on his table. When I read this, this is my holy convocation, my Sabbath. I think of that scripture in Psalm 122 where David expressed... I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. It wasn't just, oh, I'll go because you're going. Is there a party? Is it going to be fun? No, I know what was going to happen at the feast. I was excited. Take me with you. There was an assembly that I want to be a part of. And when you and I considered the privilege that's been extended, it became clear just how great of an honor, as we heard those numbers, we're nothing compared to this world in numbers. But that honor that God looked upon us and said, I want you. I'm sending this invitation to you. Come, my children. Come before me. No, I know I don't deserve it. But because he revealed to me what makes me worthy. Show me that way. I grasp that opportunity like you to be here. We don't have to read it again, but we also know we cover multiple times in Deuteronomy 14, 23 through 26, chapter 16, 13 through 15. What to do with that tithe? How are we to use that tithe? Learning to fear God. What is fear? It's an understanding, a standard that's higher than us, a standard that brought us here, a standard that kept us here, a way of holiness in which directed the standard of our conduct while in this house, a conduct that was extended outside these rooms as we participate in all kinds of events in this area, 
They saw Christ in you. Because you first put Christ there. You wanted Christ. You wanted to follow that standard. This was a time that we knew was to put to work, to put to use everything we've been taught over our life, the things we continue to learn. And we knew by this, what he said in chapter 16, we leave no one by themselves. If they need help, we've helped. We've had the card program. Our area did feast baskets. No one gets forgotten because God always provides for those who can't. He's a gracious God, and this law is teaching us to be gracious. We also learn, because of what we've experienced in this presence, Spokane Valley did not picture the millennial setting. The activities, no matter how good they were, no, how, no matter how good that food was, the picture to determine, the picture was determined, excuse me, by how. By how we responded to that high call. This picture was determined about how we engaged in that standard of why we're here. It was God in us. It was God with us. It was us making that choice to allow his vision to become our vision. It was allowing his joy to be our joy. And when we captured that vision, and when that joy was burning like a fire, we were reminded, the best is yet to come. The best is just on the horizon. That's why that vision, God gave us this opportunity to be inspired. He said, consider each other. Encourage each other to continue in these steps. Help each other. Let go of this present evil world. Join with those who walk before you on this path. Sojourn as one body. Seek that city. Seek the city whose builder and maker is God. Want and desire, fervently desire that heavenly country, that better country, a kingdom that's not of this world. A kingdom where everything that plagues us will not be there. One final thought under this first point. We were reminded, too, on that first evening and continued. God didn't call us here to debate. God didn't call us here to cause strife. We came because it's a place of reconciliation. We're not competitors for the kingdom. We're companions. We're companions for this. So when we write this letter on our hearts, write, I remember my brethren, and I will hold fast and remain faithful. And I won't do that when I get home. I will never forget. Point two. Point two, we saw. We saw. In Ecclesiastes 5.1, it states, walk prudently. Know where your foot's going. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than give the sacrifice of fools. Draw near with your mouth shut and your ears open. We intentionally came here for the purpose to hear God's word. We came here to hear and not be heard. In fact, we've heard it this morning, but on opening night, Mr. Slocum reminded us of the opportunity set before us to draw near and hear each and every day. He read through the commands. He went through Numbers 29. We heard it again this morning. And for those who were able, he said, to whom much is given, much is required. There is a high expectation that God expects us to fulfill each and every day. But he said, I'm here with you. I will help. You learn to fear me. You put me first. These things can be accomplished. Again, don't view me in this opportunity as a vacation. It's your one-on-one -on -one time with your father. 
It's your one-on-one time with your elder brother. We also heard earlier in the week about the instructions that found in Deuteronomy 14, what was listed in chapter 31, which expounded on the fact that God's laws, all these commands that we are learning about, they were designed to teach us to stop. To stop thinking about self and start thinking about God. Start thinking about the brethren. Start thinking about those in need. And we stop thinking about self. We start experiencing the value of putting God first. The value of thinking how our God thinks. The value of being gracious as our God has been gracious to us. We came to hear Psalm 85. Psalm 85. Let's pick it up in verse 8. Very beautiful psalm here. Psalm 85. Starting in verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. I want to hear it. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak, and we've heard this word quite often this feast. He will speak peace. He will speak a peace to his people and to his saints. Verse 9. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. And see this beautiful picture here. Mercy and truth have met together. We came here to hear so we can see, we can experience what's here. We didn't bring our own agendas. We wanted what he offers. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth. When peace and righteousness mercy are together and God comes first truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven yes the Lord would give what is good but if we want to receive it we need to shut our mouths and receive and listen to what he gives and our land will yield its increase righteousness will go before him and he shall make his footsteps our pathway When I read this, I think of the scriptures that we read during the Passover in John 14. We talked about, I have given them your word, Father. Then he goes on to say, it's going to be tough, but peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world defines peace, but it's what you receive in my presence. What I can give you, the only peace you need. And because we decided to keep our mouth shut and we gave that attentive ear to hear our Lord and Master, we heard those words of peace. We've actually felt peace. We've had trying times, but we felt that peace. We've also heard and were reminded that this promised peace is just not for us. It's for them. It's for all of them. It's for those in this world who suffer. Those who desperately need it, and they don't even understand it here. They will have a time. There's going to be those who are going to endure so much heartbreak, tragedy, death, destruction brought on through this tribulation. There's even going to be those who are going to need that peace at the great white throne judgment. Christ is crying out to them, You've hurt long enough. You've been separated Long enough. Come. Come to me. Receive this life-giving water. Receive the words that will give you peace. How blessed are we to be here now. Those who have ears and eyes that have been opened. Those who understand the importance of keeping our mouths closed so that we can receive the abundance of what God has to offer. It's not just monetary. It wasn't just a physical food. 
It wasn't just the fun activities. But we were given an abundance of joy, true joy. Again, that renewed vision. We've been given spiritual nutrition. We've been able to grow that bond that's formed by being part of a body. When we seek, when we are determined to seek to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of our God, when we're determined to sit at God's table, our cup, our cup will surely overflow. You know your cup has overflowed this feast because what you have been taking in in abundance is what you need for doctrine. It's what you need for reproof. It's what you need for correction. It's what you need for instruction in righteousness so that we, all of us, as the people of God, can be complete. So that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. To reflect the light, we need this word. We stay close in contact to the source so that we can reflect it even brighter. In fact, well-known scripture, Hebrews 10, not covering any earth-shattering scripture since all might have been given this feast. It happens when you're the last guy. But Hebrews 10, verse 22. Hebrews 10, 22 states, Let us draw near. Not fall in, not just stagger in. Let us draw near with a true heart. All in. Fully connected, knowing that purpose. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Knowing our work, what brings us here, it's outside ourself, and understand how thankful we are for this. So what are we expected to do? Verse 23, hold fast. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. But there's more. It's not just a trinket you put on your mantle. It's not a t-shirt that you wear. Say, I'm a Christian. No. Do. Consider one another. Consider one another in order to stir up love. Not some feel-good, mushy feeling. But to stir, to engage, to help those who need. To ignite a fire and good works. Let what's in your heart be manifested in your hands. As a people, individually, collectively. Don't forsake the assembling yourselves together as the matter of some, but exhort, encourage. This life gets us down. Even here at the feast, there's this news. No matter how hard we try to push it out, it works its way in. That's how a whispering serpent works. But we see, we help. We do this even as we see the day approaching. The application, the result of listening to God and putting him first each day helps us engage. Helps us engage in that. Helps us to understand his character. Helps us understand his nature. Helps us to understand the importance of changing from the inside out. Teaching us that proper conduct in his house. How to interact with people outside this house. How to live in our own families. How to live as the people of God. But that flip side of that coin, if we refuse to assemble, it says we honestly didn't consider God. We didn't consider his household. And we missed an opportunity to live and act as God lives, how he acts, what he does. We heard a message about this, talking about focus. When we run that race, you've got to know what's going on around you, those around you. You can't let yourself be caught off guard, distracted. That's why we understand the importance of the fear of God and the many wonderful aspects of what that fear produces in those who run this race. We learn it's, it's how he delights in us. Our God 
delights in us. We've learned how He rejoices in us and how He wants us to thoroughly rejoice in His standards. We came here to learn those standards. We came here to learn in order that we may be the teachers. God says, I started something that should be a perpetual process. Get what you need to keep it going. In fact, he read it this morning, and it's going to save you some time. We won't read it all in Nehemiah 8. Mr. Louts was covering this. There's so much more that we were able to glean and take in this week. He talks about in Nehemiah 8 where, they, where they're coming back and they find the law. He gets out there, Ezra, gives a five to six hour sermon. I'm not going to do it. My mouth's already dry. <laughs> but he does something. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Well, let's read. Uh, I'm going to do that whole note-taking thing from verse 3. Then he read from it in the open square in the front of the water gate from morning until the day before men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive. They weren't asleep. They weren't full and didn't want to pay attention. They were attentive to the book of the law because they came to hear. They came to hear in verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. This was a special moment. What we heard did our hearts just arise inside of us when those messages were being given? Because we didn't just sacrifice to come here. Again, we feasted when we were here. We beheld many great blessings. The greatest of those was to hear the Theonustos, the God-breathed word. We walked among his holy household where that word was being taught, where that word was being practiced, where that word was being shared. A great honor. Are you still standing? Is your heart still pumping in that great awe, knowing what you just experienced? what has been delivered to you? Will that be in your letter that you write on the tables of your heart? How blessed. How blessed are we to know that our God has given us those eyes that are open, ears that can hear, hearts that can comprehend the truth of what he's revealing. How blessed to know that the shoulders you've been rubbing on all week long the ones that are touching you maybe right now are not competitors trying to push you aside, jockeying for a position. But they're the shoulders that are keeping you upright. Shoulders that are helping you stay on your feet to keep walking, to give you the strength when you may feel weak. Because we put God first. We saw each other as God sees, each, sees us. We saw this deeper spiritual intent. It wasn't just about the physical blessings. It's what we heard earlier. It's understanding the importance of having the mind of Christ and knowing that this feast was more than food activities. But as Romans 14, 17 says, it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Point three. We've been inspired. We've been inspired. The result of coming here, the result of seeing what we've seen, the result of hearing what we've heard should have been interpreted as a call to action. You've been called to act. God's given you that spirit. Those eyes, those ears, that heart to understand what needs to take place now. He says, wake up out of that sleep. Know what's trying to overtake you. If you're not working on sin, sin's going to be working on you. Mr. Armstrong would say, human nature is like gravity. It's always pulling you down. If you're not pushing against it, it's pulling against you. So fight. Fight. 
And remember from where you came. Remember where you are. Remember where you're going. Now. Now is the time to act. You've been called for a time such as this. In our young adults of Bible study, we talked about what's in your hand. Look at your hands. What's in your hand? That was a question. You heard it this week as well. I was shocked. I didn't think that scripture would get brought up. But in Exodus 4, 2, God asked Moses, what's in your hand? A stick? So many people claim to hold this in their hand. Some people do. It's a book. Just like Moses. At first, it was just a shepherd's rod. But God says, Moses, change your perception. Change how you view me. Change how you view yourself with me working with you. And that stick became a sign of God's authority and his power. Moses had to learn what godly leadership was. He had to understand what it took to be the leader that God desired. And if we want to be those leaders that God has called us to be, if we want to be those voices saying, this is the way, walk you in it, we must first be willing to change our perception of what we have in our hand to this day. We must be those willing to hear that voice right now. Not just hearing it, listening to it, being obedient to it, allow those changes to take place a change from the inside out. Because, as we've learned, it's a prerequisite to becoming a teacher. If we desire to wear, and I love that sermon and does the crown. If we desire to wear that crown, if we desire to hold that scepter which represents our king, it represents his rule, it represents his high standard, symbolized by that rod of iron which he establishes, which will not bend. It will not be changed. You and I must first be willing to carry a towel and a basin. we got to do it right now, which means we have to start, as Moses had to learn, developing the characteristics of a humble servant because we're not just called to be leaders. We're called to be servant leaders. Servants who understand love. Agape, true love. Servants who understand compassion. Servants who understand mercy. Because they're here because someone applied that to them. So, never forget what's been placed in your hand. It's not common. It's holy. It's powerful. And if we let Christ work in and through us. You ain't seen nothing yet. Hold on. Get ready. Be prepared to do a work so great, as we read multiple times in Habakkuk through our lives, so great, even if we were told the details, we are like, nah, that ain't, that ain't going to happen. I know me. It will. It can. We have no excuse Again, we dined at the very table of God. Our appetites have been satisfied. His greatness, His holiness have penetrated our hearts. Again, go forth. It should be manifesting in our hands. We have to be stirred into action. A stirred that gives us great expectation. We just spent eight days being encouraged by the very presence that goes before us. The very presence that watches us from behind. The very presence that reminds us that what's with us is greater than anything that stands against us. What's required of those such honor? It's written in Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13, Micah 6, verse 8, Matthew 23, verse 23. Love, justice, mercy, and faith, and stay humble. You need to be fixed. That was the tools that helped you. Keep using them. It's time. It's time to let go of these independent mindsets. It's time to do, stop doing what we think is right in our own eyes. 
because we have been clearly shown what God expects of us. Just like John the baptizer once said, I must decrease so that he can increase. We got to look in that mirror and say, I want to see Christ even more than I see myself. I must decrease so that Christ can decrease and increase in my life. It's time to start trying to fit Christ into our lives and start allowing him to become our entire life. Christ has to be our life. He can't just simply be an aspect of our life. He has to be the entirety. You see, when that aspect is changed, the motivation, the vision, and the desire, it will return. And we'll be stirred. You're in Nehemiah chapter 4. A very, very inspiring section of Scripture. And sound crew, I apologize for what's about to happen. In Nehemiah 4, you know they're back building that wall. And what we're going to hear, read here, brethren, it can describe what we're going through right now. Nehemiah 4, verse 1. But it happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall. There were people willing to come out of this world and do something different. Stand up. Bring back what was trying to be destroyed. When he heard that they were trying to rebuild the wall, he was furious, very indignant, and mocked the Jews. Do you feel that today? I mean, not right now. But in your lives. In what the society we see happening. Verse 6. And he goes on, he, he records here. We didn't run and hide in caves. No. Verse 6 says, we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. They pushed the outside away. Kept the vision. So we're going to do this work. Verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. We knew, we, we understood the realization of our situation. We knew what stood in our way. We knew the lies. We knew all that things wanted to come against us. But no, we were vision oriented. We were stirred to action. We had that desire. So nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God. Because of them, we set watch over them day and night. We weren't foolish, was wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We did our part. Verse 13, Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked, and I rose, and I said to the nobles, I said to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Christ is still saying, do not fear, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We hear that. He's saying, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the table that you dined at. Great and awesome. And I love this. Fight. Apply this spiritually as we read this. Fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. It's time we stand and stir and fight for what we know is right. As the people of God. Fight. Keep this. Do our part in this house. Grow. Build our part of the wall. And he goes on. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their counsel to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to do his work. We tasted indeed the Lord is indeed true, faithful. He's good. Look at the blessings. Look at what the miracles happening in our midst. When we put God first and we get together and we do the work. It's not about United. It's not about any organization. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about his body. We're thankful for what he pro provides in these organizations. But we do it according to God's work, Christ's work. We keep fighting against each other. We see each other as brethren. 
So it was from that time on, we finally got the vision that half of my servants worked at construction while the other held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. And those who built, built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and without one hand they held a weapon. We keep the word of God active and we get to work. We just don't know the wall we use it. We let it change. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the peoples, the work is great. And here it's describing us right now because we're all about to go back to how far we're spread out. He goes, the work is great. And extensive, and we are separated far from one another on this wall. Who feels separated at times? We all do. We feel and we know. That's why we love here. That's why we're going to probably have to kick you out of this room when it's time to go. You don't want to leave. You don't want to leave this camaraderie ship. But he says, if you're doing your part, you and your families, your congregation, if you're doing, you're engaged. He says, therefore, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, when it will be known, there is trouble coming. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fret. He says, because you've done your part. He goes, hear that trumpet. Rally to us here. Our God will fight for us. As Rob described what the Father looks at right now. People in Jerusalem seem to be far out on that wall. They've done their part. They put God first. They're keeping his feast. God looks down and he says, no big deal. My angels got this. The trumpet was sound. They're together. I'll fight for them. They fought for a family. I fight for family. It's time we fight for family. It's time... We think about what was written in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 11. Putting first things first. It takes effort to put God here. It takes effort to love him with your whole heart, mind, and strength. Especially when you got that nagging thorn in your flesh. A problem, an adversary. But if we put forth the effort and fight, and we do our part, God says when the battle gets heated and it's more than you can handle... I'll take care of it. But you got to trust. You've been called to do your part. Every man, woman, young adult, teen, child, learn, teach. Take what God puts in your care because you're being prepared. You're learning to attune your ear to hear to hear the sound of instruction, to hear the sound of the trumpet so that when we need something, we know where to go. In the early stages of the Revolutionary War, General George Washington penned these words. The reflection upon my situation and that of this army produces many an uneasy hour when everyone else around me sleeps. Few people know the predicament we're in. By the grace of God, you know. And for what you know, you're expected to respond. You have a heart that can discern exactly the predicament that we are facing. We can't be wrapped in sleep. We got to face the reality. We got to hold fast to hope. And as we walk out those doors, we stand firm. We develop, again, not only the faith in Christ, we develop the faith of Christ, the faith that Christ had to face such great adversaries. And he saw the joy set before him. He kept walking. It would give us that proper sense of urgency. Daniel 11. One of my favorite scriptures Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. 
talking about this end time situation, things we're facing when this power is coming upon us, trying to get us distracted, trying to get us to walk away, forget why we're here, forget why we want to stay here. Daniel eleven thirty two 32 says, there will be those who do weakly against the covenant. Against the covenant they bound their life to, what they once believed, once they gave all. There will be those who will do wickedly against the covenant, and he shall corrupt with flattery. They will let their, the tickling of the ear be stronger than the foundations written on their heart. They will fall for it. But, but the people who know their God shall be strong, and they should carry out great exploits. Again, if we want to be those, we want to be those who do those great things. We must know our God. We must not fall for a God that we have not known. We don't take upon the flatteries that are presented to us. We hold fast to this relationship with the true God of heaven. And he cannot just be an acquaintance that we know, an easy button we push when we need him. But as Nehemiah states, we have fought, we have been engaged, we do in our part. So that when that trumpet blows, we know our God and we can act. We can respond because he is that pearl of great price. And we remember it was a covenant. Till death do I part. We've been called. We've been chosen. The question is, will we be faithful? Will we be faithful when we walk out these doors? Will we be faithful when the trials are at their greatest? Will we allow some evil, some God we've never heard before, turn us away from the tree of life? Will we carelessly allow someone to take our crown? Not if we know our God. Not if we really come before his presence to see and hear his work to be truly inspired by truth. We just caught a glimpse. We just caught a glimpse of a vision where dreams are made of. And it's evident that this feast didn't go as planned. I've been sick. Family's been sick. We've had some problems. There were challenges. We've been reminded we're just still imperfect beings living in a world that we're not part of. But that vision reminds us of the hope. Again, that best part is still yet on the horizon. And we can't give up. We have a promise. We have an incredible human potential laid out before us. As Paul said, it's worth the trial. It's worth the inconveniences. It's worth the discomforts you will face in this life. But how much do you want it? How much do you expect it? How much would you strive to be here next year, the next year, and ultimately be heard this morning, keeping it in the kingdom of God? Julius Caesar was excited to write back to the Senate and say, Vini, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. But because of who we are, because of what God has given us, we know he stands with us. And he's greater than anything that's against us. And because of this fact, we know we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Way more than conquerors. So we must proclaim, not with a sense of pride, not with any bragging words, but in great adoration toward our God. We did come. We have seen. We've been inspired. In just a few minutes, we'll end this service. You hope, it's going how far I get in my notes. We will end this service. We will sing one final hymn. Onward, Christian soldier. 
a very rousing hymn. And I ask us to please think about that letter you would write. Think about what it means to join with one voice in praise to our God for what he has done in our lives, what he is doing right now, and what he will continue to do in and through us in these upcoming days, weeks, months, and years ahead. As those words proceed, not just out of your mouth, as those words proceed from the innermost parts of your heart, let that vision burn. Let that joy be expressed. Let it connect you to the eternity, that wonderful promise that's been given, and with fervent desire, be eager to go forth. Eager to go forth to receive them. And as we sing, I want us to keep this final set of scriptures in mind. Isaiah 62. Starting in verse 1, we're going all the way through it. Isaiah 62, verse 1 says, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. God says, I will not be silent. I won't be still. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Again, I won't be quiet. I won't be inactive. No more being idle, waiting. When I read this verse... I was reminded, last week I was in New York and was in the Holocaust Memorial Park. And on one of the stones there was inscribed this little poem found in the cellar of a, in, in Cologne, Germany, where the Jews would hide. And it touched me so much I had to leave the park. And it's probably going to get me right now. It wrote, and I want you to think about it, this is hiding. Every footstep you hear could be someone coming to kill you. Every engine you hear stop could be troops coming to get you. But this was written on that wall. I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love when I feel it not. I believe in God even when he's silent. God says, I will not for Jerusalem's sake, for Zion's sake, no more be silent. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness. And her salvation is a light that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name. Which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory. Think of Malachi 3.16. You think it through this. He wants to set us as jewels to display on his head, too. You shall be a crown of glory. In the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem. In the hand of your God, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. You won't have that as your identity. You won't have that destitute feeling. Neither shall your land any more be termed a waste of devastation, a desolate place. But you shall be called... Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her. Your land, Beulah, which means to marry, to be the Lord over. Because the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. You'll be connected to something. Your inheritance, your heritage. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. You, you who make mention of the Lord, you, sitting in this room in Spokane Valley, who know the truth, who have been given such an honor, who make mention, who remember who they are, who remember who's leading them, you do not keep silent. You do not give rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise of the earth. 
See, the Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his arm of his strength. Surely I will no longer give your grain to be food to your enemies. And the sons of your, uh, the foreigner shall not drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who have gathered it shall eat it. And the praise of the Lord, those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. And here's your call to action. Go through the gates. Go through the gates, he cries out. Prepare the way of, for the people. Build up. Build up the highway. Take out the stones. Lift up that banner for the people. Lift it up. God is with us. Christ leads us. We're not ashamed of who we are. We're not ashamed for what we do. Because indeed the Lord has proclaimed to the end of this world. Say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. Let us go forth. Let us go forth as ecclesia. As we heard, this bride of Christ, with his help, let us make ourselves ready. Let's clothe ourselves with those holy garments. Let's be active using what we've been given to help strengthen those hands that hang low, those, leg, those knees, excuse me, that have come feeble at times. Let's make straight the path that our feet will walk upon. Let's remove those stumbling blocks. Let's lay aside the sin, that weight that so easily ensnares us. And let us walk the way. Let us walk in the way of the truth. Let us walk in the way, the truth that leads us towards life. We're leaving here changed. You're not the same person who walked in these doors eight days ago. You have been changed. You have been given something great. Now it's time to be a blessing to the one who has blessed you. Again, you're leaving here better than how you arrived. God says, that's something to be rejoicing over. That's something not to be silent about. Lift up that banner of your great God and proclaim with one voice his glory and march into that battle. No matter what you have to face, never forget the joy. Never forget that you stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Be the hope for those who have no hope. Brethren, until we meet again, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May the Lord lift up your countenance and may he give you peace. I look forward to seeing you next year. But if it's to the kingdom, please be safe. We love you. Godspeed that day.